Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. Uh, I am going to present a kind of mix of uh, case study and a new concept. And the concept is called combinatoric innovation. And I want uh, to describe the conditions to make this phenomenon work. And I will also sketch to you in an example where I am involved myself. Um, and uh, it's about how to look at the future in, uh, in, in a world that is highly complex, as it is being described here. Um, and, and actually, uh, a lot of companies uh, think that uh, they are uh, more or less in a stable situation and that they can continue the way they work as they do now. But I think uh, this is uh, going to happen to most of them uh, that, that believe in that, uh, in, in that situation. Uh, and and uh, most of the time I spend with a bank, a Dutch bank, and, and we all know that uh, a lot of uh, this industry is more or less uh, yeah, out of date. Yeah, as in a very nice song, uh, song by uh, Randy Newman, he says, I'm dead, but I don't know it. Yeah, and uh, this is very much related to this uh, term of zombie banks. Uh, and, and I'm looking at uh, how can we change patterns. This is a good example of a uh, person that is uh, used to work with a certain pattern. And his, her boss is telling her, listen, this is the 21st century. What are you doing? So she uh, desperately tries to change her, uh, yeah, her patterns, her way of working. And, and here is the result. Um, <laughs> Actually, I was, showing, I was showing this video to my daughter, and she said, this is an interesting machine. Uh, it's printing automatically. You don't have to send the file to the printer. So that was 20 years of innovation gone away. Um, so instead of working on a zombie bank, I would like to work on what we call next generation bank. And the next generation bank is uh, the bank, uh, the next generation of banks, but also the bank targeting next generation of, of, of customers and employees. Uh, and, and, and the question is, how do we get to such an organization? So I, I uh, asked a lot of people, if you look at organizations that are future-proof, what kind of uh, keywords come up to you? What kind of characteristics? And uh, the word that is most often mentioned is the word creativity, which is the, 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 the orange one at the, at the left side. And then we have a cluster of, of, uh, of attributes uh, all related to networking, be, uh, things like diversity, outward-looking, customer focus, indicating you're not alone. You're not alone. So creativity and you're not alone. What can we make out of that? Well, people often ask me, can you measure creativity? Actually, you can. This is a very interesting concept. It says, well, creativity is uh, more or less defined as the way as multi-paradigmatic thinking. What is the amount of thoughts people can have in their heads? And there are two ways to improve the number of, uh, to increase the number of different patterns that fit in your neural system. And the first one is by asking questions, yeah, which was also mentioned in the previous presentation. And they're not the question, what's the time? but more questions like, uh, what do you think? Or questions like, what would happen if? Uh, the basis of scenario thinking. That type of questions, we call them big questions. The other thing is about lateral thinking, making new combinations, reaching out. Now, what is a very human process where people make new combinations? That is uh, humor. Every time people laugh, it's at the moment that a new combination is being made. Uh, an unexpected illogical combination. That's when people start to laugh. Now, if you make uh, a product out of these two, so you multiply the number of times you ask a big question during a day with the number of times you laugh during a day, you get a thing that is called the creativity index, which is being seriously researched. Well, here you see a result that is not applicable to you. This is an average. And it says that uh, when you put this thing equal to one for 44-year-old people, uh, for, for, for four-year-old children, it reduces to 0.02 for 44-year-old people, which we call the state of terminal seriousness. <laughs> and, and the question I ask myself every day, which is more or less my job, is how do I avoid this from happening? How can I still create an environment where people are asking questions and want to make new combinations? And, and uh, what I do every time when I have a meeting, I also uh, make a score of the creativity index, which is the number of times people ask a question and the number of times people have asked, uh, have laughed. And I can tell you there's a very strict correlation between that number and the perceived quality of that meeting. Now, how do we create an environment where people are, and I, I very much enjoyed the previous presentation, where people are open and, 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 and uh, uh, can be creative and entrepreneurial and want to share their knowledge and, and creativity, Actually, you cannot force people to do that. Uh, we tried that, but uh, these uh, methods are illegal now. So uh, instead of that, you better create an environment, uh, an environment where people are willing to contribute, are willing to be open, are willing to be creative, can, uh, can show the creativity. It's in it. Uh, we, we removed it. We destroyed it. And uh, an environment typically consists of four uh, subspaces. And the first one is the process space. How are we organized? What kind of processes do we have? What kind of systems? What kind of procedures? 
The second element of the environment is the social space. What kind of people are there? What do they think is important? How do they treat each other? How do they treat me? The third one is uh, increasingly the, the virtual space. Well, we, we, we work, we live uh, partly in a in virtual space. But also very important, and I will show you an example in a minute, is the physical space. F uh, often neglected. Uh, I recently visited a company. They are producing uh, paper, and they showed me a new product hall. They spent millions on this, on this production process. But I was there to talk about innovation. I, can, I, uh, I said, can you show me your innovation hall? And actually, I was taken to a kind of uh, yeah, very uh, silly, uh, uh, sloppy building, and that was their uh, environment where people had to do creative work. Very interesting. Now, if you look at environments that are stimulating, that are open for innovation and, and, and open uh, thinking, then I would like to refer you to a an, uh, an, an piece of uh, lateral thinking uh, done by Charlie Ledbetter, who made a comparison between innovation and evolution. So he tried to translate conditions that uh, yeah, are necessary for evolution or that we find in the evolution process, and he translated that uh, via an analogy to uh, concepts that are relevant for innovation. And he came up with nine uh, principles. I don't have time to go through them, all of them. Uh, but diversity by far is the most important one, and not diversity as, an, as a passive thing. Eh? We tolerate different people. No, we actively enjoy the fact that people are different. That is the basis of diversity. That's the basis of progress. Uh, I will also say a little uh, thing about spare capacity later. Now, based on all this thinking, we have created an environment, uh, a physical environment as well, which is called the Dialogues House. It's uh, built on uh, sacred ground. It is the former dealing room of uh, Emil Amro Bank in the Netherlands. It's about 2,000 square meters. And we have turned it into an open innovation environment, but it's more than open. We also have uh, room for, yeah, for serendipity. I will come to that. But we, and we have a program running there. We invite a lot of people from outside and inside just to meet, to talk about things, uh, things related to innovation, entrepreneurship, creativity, knowledge management. And we just see what comes out of it. Uh, and, and typically what happens is that people think that when they build something, people will start using it. Uh, it's the same like uh, some uh, software mistakes. Uh, and, and, and we see now more and more if people use it, it will build itself. And that creates this uh, sense of belonging we are looking for. Now, the point is that knowledge is everywhere. And so by inviting people in, and, and that was also very clear from the previous speaker, you can get access to, to uh, intellectual capital that was not accessible before. But most of all, when you ask people about what percentage of the knowledge that you have, the intellectual capital that you have, is actually being uh, activated, is being used, they come typically with this type of answers. Uh, they say, well, about 50, 60 percent of my intellectual capacity is, is really being used. And I don't know whether the number is right, but what they say is that more can be used. And I was looking into ways to improve this number. It should not be 100 percent. I think then you're ready for job counseling. But uh, how can you improve this number? Because if, if, if it's only a few percent, then already you talk about quite a lot of uh, added value. And I, I was stimulated by this uh, story about these uh, six blind monks that are being asked to describe an elephant. Uh, and, and one says, well, I think an, uh, it's a, a thick rope. And the other one says, oh, no, no, it's a tree. And the third one says, no, it's a, it's a wall. They will never understand what an elephant is until the moment they start talking to each other and, and combine their experiences. That's what I try to do. And it's a very human uh, yeah, very human behavior to have a different view when you think, uh, when we talk about the same topics. Uh, you, you, uh, sorry, you, 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 you see a very good example of, of people uh, <laughs> thinking about the same topic but have a different opinion. Now, I came across a very extreme example of this by uh, looking at a piece of art produced by a an, an, an Swiss uh, sculpture called uh, Marcus Ratz. He produces an, 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 a sculpture, and I think this was very, very interesting. When you look at it from different perspectives, you see different things. Uh, and here you will see what happens. So at one point you see no, and if you walk around it, it will change into yes. Uh, and, and I think it's a fascinating piece of art. But the funny thing is some people that have already been, uh, only been standing in the door opening, they say, well, I saw a very nice statue, and it said no. Another one said, I was standing over there, and I saw yes. And both of them don't understand what this, what this thing is about. This thing is about transformation, because they have to understand what is happening when you walk from one side to the other side. That is what I call combinatoric innovation. That is, you bring people together with different viewpoints, with different perspectives, with different ideas, and just see what comes out of it. The big question that is b behind combinatoric innovation is what could we do together? 
That is, I think, a very interesting source of value in the near future. And with that, you don't co uh, create a community of practice, you create a community of serendipity, of discovery. Uh, you know, serendipity is the art of discovery of something very important by coincidence. By a Dutch uh, scientist described as looking for the needle in the haystack and then finding the beautiful daughter of the farmer. That is serendipity. Uh, it's about uh, discovery, it's about collaboration. And the business case for such an uh, innovative project is not only what's in it for me, but it's only also about what's in it for you. It's a collaborative effort and it is tr trying to address the needs of both parties. You have to trust each other, of course. I mean, if you do that, <laughs> uh, that's a very, big, a very bad basis for this, uh, this process. The point is that this combinatoric innovation is very scary to managers because you cannot control it. You don't know what will happen. What could we do together? We, we sit together, we don't know. And the moment we start talking, we will discover it. And maybe the answer is nothing. And maybe the answer is something very important. But you do not know up front. Yeah. And, and, and people are always looking for business cases. Now, you know, business case is a set of lies that makes management decide what we want them to decide. I think that's the best description of a business case. So you will also have some surprises. Yeah. If you start mix up uh, ideas, if you start to mix up intellectual capital of different uh, sources, you can have surprises. And sometimes the, the surprise is, is, is not that, 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 that nice. Eh? Then we talk about the failure. Failure and successes come uh, together. That's why we have set up the Institute of Brilliant Failures, <laughs> highlighting the importance of experimentation, trial and error, to generate uh, new intellectual capital in a way that was not possible before. Now, as an example, we look, look at new uh, concepts. Now, uh, I was already talking about the banks in the beginning, and uh, the only thing I can uh, observe is that there's absolutely no crisis in the intellectual capital market. Yeah, so I think that, that's where the future is. We should uh, combine, uh, I, I don't say we should get away from, from uh, financial capital, but uh, at least we should bring into the picture uh, intellectual capital. And I really would like to challenge all of us to come up with the idea of the intellectual capital bank. What would that be? I have no idea yet, but I think when we combine our, our efforts, or combine our, our uh, yeah, experiences and ideas, we must come up with the concept of the Intel Capital Bank. Now, elements of it, you already see it happening. And in the previous uh, presentation, it was very clear that uh, crowdsourcing, uh, uh, combining intellectual capital is taking off. Uh, we see very interesting platforms. Uh, Innocentive is a very uh, well-known platform for combination of, 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 of knowledge in solving uh, long-standing or, or uh, new problems. Uh, but we see also, and that was also mentioned, the phenomenon of crowdfunding. And crowdfunding is very interesting because that's not only contributing in terms of money, but also in, in terms of brains. It's, uh, this, this is a famous uh, example of uh, Kickstarter with this, uh, uh, with this uh, Tic Tac Nano, which is a kind of uh, wristlet. You can put an, 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 uh, a small iPod in it, the iPod Nano, and it turns uh, into a, a watch. And the guy who wanted to develop this needed $15,000, and uh, within no time he got $941,000. And actually he didn't not only get the money, he also got the feedback. He also got from the people the, uh, the, more or less the, the, the confirmation that this was a good idea. So he also used their brains. Now, uh, we, we try to work this uh, out further, and we have set up now a crowdfunding platform, the first crowdfunding platform uh, de uh, developed by a bank, in crowdfunding social entrepreneurs. And actually, you can also get a financial return on uh, investment, but it is more a return on involvement and a return on engagement. Uh, it's called Seeds, and Seeds brings uh, people, creates communities around social entrepreneurs. And more important than just the money that they get, they, uh, on average they need 40, 50,000 uh, euros, is that by creating the community they will get confirmation that the ideas are, are, are valuable, that uh, they can create uh, more or less also a, a board of inspiration, they, create, uh, they, they get market insights, uh, it, it's uh, via Facebook and Twitter that the products and the activities are being broadcast. So this is much more than just raising money. It's raising money and intellectual capital. And I think this blending of these two concepts, that is the future. You can also use it for other purposes. Uh, Life and, and, and myself are involved in a platform for sponsoring fundamental research, uh, where, one minute, yeah, uh, where we re uh, use money and uh, engagement and involvement to uh, support very uh, important progress in science. So I hope that with this case study and with this idea about uh, uh, combinatoric innovation, I uh, I've, yeah, I've been able to, to share some insights about 
yeah, how do you create an, an, an open environment? Because that's very important for innovation. If we talk a lot about policies and about uh, the, the, yeah, the, the innovation itself, I, I, I'm particularly interested in the conditions that uh, support this, uh, this innovation. Serendipity, for me, is a very crucial business process. And, and I think that by combining intellectual sources, we not only add intellectual capital, but we create new intellectual capital. But for that, you need trust more than control, and still, failure is an option. Thank you very much.